Um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, <clears throat> we got some new people that's joined the church and lesson sharing and this is something I haven't taught on in a while, it's been a couple of months, but it's something very important to me. When I was in, uh, I, was, I was giving this testimony on a Zoom meeting the other night with some people in Australia, and we was talking about the, we, the, the subject of the fear of the Lord came up. And uh, David said over there in the Psalms, he says, who can know, who can know his secret errors? God cleanse me of secret faults. And then he says, keep me also from presumptuous sins. Amen. As a young man, I sinned against the Lord presumptuously a lot in my early 20s and, and, uh, I tell you, I woke up one morning on my couch in a cold sweat, and I was just terrified. And for about six months, the scriptures just demolished me, cut me into a million pieces. Just scripture after scripture in my heart, just coming at me. You know, fornication, uncleanness, uh, uh, covetousness and let it not be once named among you for this ye you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater hath any and just those scriptures and guys I tell you right now there's nothing cleaner than the fear of the Lord yeah. David said it the fear of the Lord is clean enduring forever amen yeah. the fear of the Lord to purify your heart and what long after that God brought me to that place that I started learning my Bible like I'd never learned it before. Amen. He, he, he got me in a position where he could teach me. And what I want to talk about this morning is something that's very important to me because it made the Bible open up to me. I understood the Bible when I understood these truths. Now here in 1 Timothy 2.4, you have an absolute statement concerning the will of God. The will of God is not, it's not, doesn't change from person to person. Amen? You want, you want an absolute statement about the will of God. You know what a lot of people, you know why a lot of people want the will of God to not be absolute? It's because they want it to they want it to fit into their life. This is why they always say, What is God's will for my life? Nothing. He nailed you to a cross. Get over it. Yeah. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God's will is in Christ. Now, right here, you have an absolute statement about the will of God, and you may not like it, but it's still it's still his will. That's why I love what, what, what Tiff is doing for them, them homeless men. Because it, before Paul says this, you know what Paul tells Timothy there? He said, I exhort therefore first of all that prayer, supplications, giving intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. Why? This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who will have all men to be saved. You know, learning to pray for all men is, gonna, is going to give you a correct and godly heart in this present world. Yeah. Amen? Now, what is God's will for all men? God's will for all men is to be what? Saved. And, you see that and? He doesn't just want them to get saved. He also wants them to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, Satan understanding this, Satan is actively in enmity and involved in two operations. If God wants all men to be saved, what do you think Satan wants? And if he can't stop you from getting saved, what do you think his next step is? Amen? Keep you from coming to the knowledge of the truth. And so Satan, in light of this, Satan has set up his own form of godliness. 
What you have to understand about Satan is we always think of Satan as God's opposite. Everything God is, Satan's the opposite. That may be true, but Satan doesn't appear that way. Satan transforms himself into as much as a glorious, in, 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 into as much light as he possibly can to deceive. I make this point all the time. If I went out and made a $100 bill on a piece of notebook paper, I couldn't fool any of you. If I, if I tried to make a counterfeit $100 bill and I just went over to my my house and took a piece of white notebook paper and wrote $100 on it, I wouldn't fool any of you. What makes a good counterfeit is to make it as close to the real thing as you possibly can. And because this is God's will, Satan has set up a counterfeit form of godliness where men are ever learning and never able to come. To the knowledge of the truth. You getting it? God's will is for all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul says right here, back up in verse 5, he says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with uh, uh, sins, uh, laden with uh, sins and carried away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There's a form of godliness in this world that will take you captive and hold you in it for your whole life where you're ever going to be at learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Yep. Yep. I hear people all the time, you know, I used to hear this when I was a kid, oh, so-and-so got in church of course, it's the church of God, but at least they're going somewhere. What, truth is irrelevant? Truth doesn't matter, does it? God's will ain't important. And you think it's okay to go set in a system that have taken people captive and kept them ignorant of the knowledge of the truth? It's not okay, especially once you understand that those forms and those counterfeits and those systems are Satan's snare to take people captive and keep them from coming to the knowledge that God wants them to have. Amen? Amen. Now, you're warned about this all through your Bible. God said something in Genesis 2. Genesis 3, the serpent shows up. He wants to have a discussion about what God said. See, God, Satan ain't an atheist. James said all the devils believe and tremble. Only man's stupid enough to, believe, to, be, to be an atheist. Only man's that ignorant. The devils believe and tremble. Satan, who wants to usurp the authority of God, knows the only way that he can have authority over the, over the creation is to get men out from under the authority of the Word of God. So what do you got to do? You got to get them to question it. Amen? Shows up, hath God said. Hey, Eve, let's talk about what God said. Amen? Look here in Jeremiah 23, 36. Ye have perverted the words of the living God. You think the King James issue is not important? Yeah. Amen. Amen. God says right there that every man's going to bear his own burden. Why? Because they've perverted his words. The words of the Lord are pure words. Ye have perverted the words of the living God. Yeah. Amen. Matthew twenty two twenty nine. 29. Ye do err. Why? Not knowing the what? 
Amen? Go ask, go ask. Put me to the test sometime. Find the preachers in this area and ask them if they got the scriptures. And when they say they do, take them to 2 Timothy 3.16 where it said all scriptures given by inspiration of God and ask them if they've got inspired words. <laughs> ask them if the Bible they hold in their hand was given by inspiration. Yeah. So you done cornered them. Amen. Most preachers running around America don't even believe they have scriptures biblically because scriptures were given by inspiration. And if the book you have wasn't given by inspiration of God and it's just a translation and reliable, then you don't have scriptures. You got people out, you got those who pervert the words of God, those who err not knowing the scriptures. Paul said, for we are not as which corrupt the word of God. So let's think about this. The vast majority of humanity don't care about the word of God. And then what's left of them, many of them corrupt the word of God. So let's get this straight. You better be careful. You better get your head screwed on right when you're walking through this world. If you go back to what Satan said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the most high God. You better look for him in two places, politics and religion. And that's why it's the two things you can't talk about. Why? Because you always make somebody mad. Why? Because people don't like authority. Amen? Amen? I hear people say the Bible's my final authority. Well, what's the authority before you get there? The Bible's to be your only authority. Not your final one. Look at, look at what he says here. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. You see those four things. God wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. There's a form of godliness where men are ever learning and able to come, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth because those people pervert the words of God. They err not knowing the scriptures. They corrupt the word of God and they rest it to their own destruction. Amen. That means not everybody running around with a book and a Bible knows what they're doing with it. This is why Paul... Tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, and you got to understand the work that Paul's talking about here. This ain't so that we can sit in echo chambers and regurgitate talking points of right division to each other for the rest of our lives. It's the only time Paul mentions it. And it's in the context of people being ensnared by the devil. And he's saying, Timothy, there's a work. And he says, I want you to study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Study to show yourself approved. What does this workman need to be able to do in order to approve himself unto God? He needs to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. You know, we live, we live in a sad country where if I, if I did this, let's think about it. Jar of mayo, right? Then I come over here and I say jar of mustard. How many of y'all believe they're the same? But then, listen, y'all... Nobody has any trouble reading any book but that King James Bible. Man is in such rebellion against that book, it's not even funny. And you can think you're not, but I can find out real quick if you are. Because if I put up gospel of the kingdom and gospel of the grace of God, 
He was like, it's the same. You don't think that way about anything else. And people get fighting mad over this stuff. When it's simply fifth grade English. You don't look at this word and just be like, well, they're both jars, therefore they're the same. But you see, gospel of, you see, of means there's contents. So when you say gospel of, you're talking about the contents of that gospel. The content, there's a, there's a gospel that the contents are about the kingdom. There's a gospel that the contents are about the grace of God. Amen? And Satan has used or ignorance of biblical words. Right? He's used our ignorance of these things to create a form of godliness that denies the power thereof and takes people captive into a system where they're ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And if I want to recover people out of that snare of the devil, I have to study to show myself approved unto God as a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Do you understand? So something we, we never really talk about when it comes to this passage is this word study. What does that word mean? Well, he tells Timothy in 4.13, till I come, give what? So part of our study is to give attendance. To what? Reading. Exhortation. Doctrine. Then he tells him, meditate upon these things. Attendance, meditation, dedication. Give thyself wholly to them. Attendance, meditation, dedication. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine and then continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. What are they being saved from? Well, it ain't hell. What they're being saved from in that context was the, the people, uh, Paul just laid out the mystery of godliness there. And he said, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Mm -hmm. And he tells Timothy what to do in light of that. And he says, if you do this, you'll not only save yourself, but them that hear thee. Amen? Studies a little more than just, you know, understanding some charts and Bible timelines and and stuff like that. Study is giving attendance. Look over here what Solomon says. Incline thine ear and apply thine heart. Now look at these conditions. If thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. There's conditions there. It has to do with the inclination of the ear, the application of the heart. Right? If you cry after knowledge, lift up thy voice. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures. So we're talking about people that give attendance, meditate, uh, 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 give, dedicate themselves to these things, continue in them. They want them. They want this knowledge and understanding the same way that men want gold and silver. Solomon says in Proverbs, buy the truth and sell it not. You know what it means? If the truth must be bought, come to the knowledge of the truth. If that truth must be bought, guess what that means? 
It's going to cost you something. Amen. Amen. Now here in Isaiah 28, we're just talking about the study aspect. How do we study? Well, here's two questions in this chapter and verse. Whom shall he teach knowledge? That word whom means the object. Who is the object's of God's teaching them knowledge. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Two questions. Whom's he going to teach and who's he going to make understand? The answer, them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the what? Why? For precept must be upon precept. Doesn't mean, you. this, this, this means that you can't skip over 60 verses and go find the verse that you like. You're never going to be taught. You're never going to understand doctrine that way. What a lot of people do is they read the theological books first. And they get their views. Then they pick up the Bible and they're trying to read the Bible in light of the views that they've already prejudicedly have. Or how's God going to teach? Who's he going to teach and who's he going to make understand doctrine? Them that go precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. That's how God teaches. That's how God makes you to understand. Amen. Not hop skipping around and pulling verses from all over the Bible to build a doctrine. Doctrine is built precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So what happens, there's a lot of people that err not knowing the scriptures. I mean, guys, if I wanted to, man, I could be the meanest preacher to ever walk this earth. I'd get up and be like, any of you that ain't circumcised is going to be cut off. I'd give you a Bible for it, Genesis 17. Then next week, y'all come in here and I'd get you all messed up. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but a new creature. I could be, I could, I could have you so messed up you wouldn't know up from down by hop jumping around all over the Bible. Just, just, Amen. This is how God teaches. This is why Paul says in First Corinthians two thirteen that the things we speak we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. You know, like the systematic theology books, eschatology and pneumatology and Christology and soteriology and, amen. Where'd they learn them words? Man's wisdom, it's Greek, amen. But he says, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Well, how does the Holy Ghost teach you these words? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So what does that mean? As you go precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, the Holy Ghost is teaching you by comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, what does the word compare mean? It means to examine multiple things to understand their relationship by noticing differences and similarities. Amen? Y'all know how, I mean, y'all do this every day of your life. Y'all make comparisons, judgments. Amen? Let me give you an example. And I, I know this one's hard in America now, boy. This one, what I'm about, this comparison I'm about to show you, this, this one's hard for Americans to get anymore, but for me, it's kind of common sense. Man and a woman. Right? Any one of you can know that there's similarities between these two, but there's also noticeable differences. They're not the same. That one can produce a baby. That one can give birth to a baby. That one can't. And if you, if you believe he can, they give you a job on the Supreme Court today. 
How in the world can a person that don't understand basic biology interpret our law? You can't even give a definition of a woman. But this is an example of comparing. And so as you go through the word of God, you are comparing spiritual things with spiritual and in the process you are learning how to rightly divide. Do y'all know how to rightly divide these two? Well, the same is true with the Bible. Through studying and comparing Scripture with Scripture, you're learning how to rightly divide the word of truth. Because Satan is going to take this word of truth, pervert it, twist it, corrupt it, and create a system for the purpose of ensnaring people and keeping them from coming to the knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. And you studying to show yourself approved and know how to rightly divide the word of truth, understand how God uses these words. For example, the Christian has been taught that anytime they see that word to assume a water ordinance. And I can show you a baptism in the Bible where not a drop of water was shed on anybody. Israel passed through the Red Sea with the cloud over their head. Not a drop of water got on any of them and they were baptized under Moses. And then you got guys like Doc Dry Cleaners. Well, Israel had a dry baptism. Amen. But see, you've been programmed. You've been programmed when it comes to that one. Israel drank the same spiritual drink and ate the same spiritual meat. Why do you think Paul tells them when they come together, he said, do you not have houses to eat in? The cup which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread. You can't get carnal people to understand this stuff. Religion has so messed it up and so counterfeited this form of godliness using this vocabulary that Christians have not been taught this vocabulary by the Spirit of God and he's so messed it up. So what we, what we have to do is study, rightly divide, and then we will be able to instruct those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of what? What's he talking about? Well, right here there were men who concerning the truth have erred. Saying what? The resurrection. Is that a Bible doctrine? But notice they erred concerning that truth. They said it's past already. And what happened? They overthrow what? Doesn't mean that people quit believing. Once your faith, once your faith is, becomes subject to an error of the truth, your faith has been overthrown. People's like, oh, we just got some minor doctrinal differences. And you hear these, these, these liberal-minded people all the time. As if the truth isn't important. This error concerning this truth overthrew the faith of some. And Paul wants us to study so that we can instruct those that are in opposition so that God can grant them repentance through the acknowledging of the truth and they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. So right division is not so that we can come together and talk about it all the time. Right division is so that we can go out here and instruct these people so that they can recover them, themselves out of the snare of the devil by the acknowledging of the truth. A correcting of the error. Amen? 
And so understand that the way this form of godliness operates here is the same way Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist. There it is again. What's God's will for all men what? Be saved. Be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. What do these men who have a form of godliness do? They resist what? How do they do it? The same way Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. Moses turned water into blood. They did the same. So how do they operate? They op operate in counterfeit. They're going to use your language. If you don't, if, listen man, if you ain't in that book, you ain't going to know the difference between a Roman Catholic and a Baptist and a Methodist and a Presbyterian and Episcopalian and Church of Christ. Guarantee you, Catholics are going to use the word baptism, gospel, and Lord's Supper. So is the Methodist, the Baptist, the Presbyterian, the Episcopalian. They're all going to use this vocabulary. And I feel sorry. I feel sorry, man. Paul even tells us that this, this stuff is going to get worse and worse. Evil men, seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We just carry about our day. Not realizing that it's just getting worse and worse. Finding a man that's been brought to the knowledge of the truth in America is like looking for a needle in a haystack. And finding a church that has people that know how to rightly divide the word of truth is getting harder. There's a whole states in America that don't have them. Right. Yeah. Amen. So what are we talking about? Well, here's an example of why we have to study. All right? Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching what? Now, most Americans running around, they think it sounds good and pious to be like, we follow the words in red. When you start talking about the distinct ministry and authority and apostleship given to the Apostle Paul, they say, we follow Jesus. What was Christ preaching? Look here now. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Now let's see if they're the same. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ, how was Christ preaching that he had died when he ain't died yet? Come on. But my preacher, but my preacher, there you go. My preacher said there's only one gospel. There you go. Your preacher, the authority, is this book, the authority. Paul ain't preaching a kingdom here. He's preaching how that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. None of that had happened at this time, so how could Christ be preaching it? Man, it's not until Matthew 16. What comes first, guys? Four or 16? You ready? Now, right here, he went about. If you go back earlier in the chapter, he says, when he had heard about the death of John from that time forth. But now it says, from that time forth, Matthew 16 began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. It's not till Matthew 16 Christ even starts talking about his death and resurrection. Peter had been preaching the gospel of the kingdom since Matthew chapter 10. What? 
Well, if there's only one gospel, preach, Peter had to be preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. However, when Christ tells him about his coming death and resurrection, Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Say it, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Know what it means? Christians are ignorant about that. And so what do they do? They go around, you, got, you, ask, you ask a preacher in America how to get saved. And he'll take parts from all over the Bible. Repent and be baptized and sell all your goods and give to the poor. And... How about John 3, 16? Yeah. There you go. But, yeah, that verse says nothing about Christ dying for your sins. Yeah. Be now look here, 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 here's a good one. So you got, there's one. Oh, there's two. Here's three. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. There's another gospel being preached today, which Paul said is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So right now, not only... Is there the gospel of Christ? But there's a perversion of that gospel being preached. People read a verse like this and just, oh well, let me go about my day. If I go to church, I'm in safe territory. Are you reading this stuff? You're in dangerous territory when you start getting into the religious realm. You're in a place where they're perverting, corrupting, twisting, erring. It needs to be taken serious, guys. Here's, here's something. The mystery of the gospel. You see in this stuff? You think, you think Christianity knows what they're talking about when they throw that word around? Right here's one. The everlasting gospel. There's only one. I heard a young boy in Michigan one time say Dr. Ruckman went to hell because he believed in more than one gospel. He said Dr. Ruckman's burning in hell right now because he believed there was more than one gospel in the Bible. And he said the Bible calls it the everlasting gospel. How about reading, bud? Because it tells you what the angel said. You want to know what he preached? This is what he preached. Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. No, he preached, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And it's preached to them that dwell on the earth. Guess where you're at at this point? You're not on the earth anymore. And it's preached to them on the earth at the hour of his judgment. You're not living in the hour of his judgment. You're living in a time accepted and in a day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This everlasting gospel is not being preached on the earth today. What's being preached today is the gospel of the grace of God. We're not even preaching the gospel of the kingdom. We're not going around telling people the kingdom's at hand, the kingdom's at hand. That stuff stopped after the cross. Because when they asked Christ, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom? He said, it's not for you to know. What? You told us it was at hand for the last three years. Now it's not for you to know the time. Stuff changes. I'm sorry, I've been reading my Bible. When God told me to study, I studied. I gave attendance. Here's, here's, here's another word they're going to use on you. Go to a Pentecostal church. Man, they're obsessed with that thing right there. They're obsessed with the kingdom. Don't know anything about it. Let me show you what I'm talking about. What are we, what are we talking about? We're talking about rightly dividing. There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his 
kingdom. Matthew 12, 28, if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. You say they're the same. They can't possibly be. You say, how do you know they're not the same? Because the spirit of God and the son of man are not the same. Do you see it? Son of what? Spirit of This one is coming. You see it? This kingdom is coming. You can see it when it comes. It means it's physical. It's flesh and blood. Because man is flesh and blood. That one right there had already come. You with me? You just going to keep using terms? Amen? Then the kingdom of God is come. The kingdom of the Son of Man coming. The kingdom of God already come. Look at that one right there. The kingdom of heaven. What do you have to have? What did they have to have to get into the kingdom of heaven? They had to have a righteousness that exceeded the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Where are they going to get that righteousness? If they don't have it, ye shall in no case enter. There's, that means there's no exception to what he's saying. If they want into the kingdom of heaven, their righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Well, how, now look here, kingdom of God. Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. They can't possibly be the same. You say, you're confusing me, preacher. That's the point. It's always been the point. Don't run around using words you don't know anything about them. Kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven is the same. Why? Because you're lazy? Or because you never heard it before? You can't, look, enter, enter. You get into this one with righteousness. You get into this one by birth. This is why he tells them, seek ye first what? How do you get into that kingdom? Birth. And then what do you have? He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the only way they're going to get into this one. One is a spiritual kingdom, one is physical. Got it? Paul tells you what the kingdom of God is right here. It's not meat and drink. Well, then why did Christ say, you see me no more? Or why did he say, I will drink of the, he said, I will no more drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it with you anew in my Father's kingdom. You see how that book is? Got a verse says it's not meat and drink, and then Christ saying, I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine till I drink it with you anew. Preacher, Better be careful. Right about a revelation. On. No. Josh Morgan at the Jehovah Witness Church mm. asked me to come and worship with them so that we could usher in the kingdom of God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, God's just waiting on a bunch of JWs and Fairmont, ain't he? Self-centered people, man. But did you see how many, have you been by that church over there? Mm -mm. They're adding on that church. You ought to see the people that's coming in. Kingdom Hall. You talking about over there going towards Muriel's, that one? I mean, they got brought in their homes and everything. Everybody, I, we went in that neighborhood knocking doors one time, Gary. Everybody there goes to that JW church. And when they ask for help, they bring in guys come from all over the country mm -hmm. to help them build and give them money. Unbelievable. Yeah. Satan's slick, brother. Right here is what the kingdom of God is. It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And that's why Paul tells you that if you keep walking after the flesh, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. What's he mean? 
you're not going to inherit righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. What were the three fruits of the Spirit? Love, faith, joy. Or love, peace, joy. What is, what is righteousness? Faith which worketh by love. Peace and joy. See? How did I learn that? How did I? Now, listen, man. You know how many Christians running around using this passage right here to try to convince you that your works are going to keep you from going to heaven? You say, how'd you, how'd you learn how to interpret that passage, preacher? I went line upon line, precept upon precept, and I learned what the kingdom of God was before I got to a passage talking about not inheriting it. You say, well, is this really important? If God wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth, it is. Now, just to top it all off, now God throws you for a loop up here and says the kingdom of Christ and of God. There's the Son of Man. There's God. Why would he do that? Because ultimately the spiritual kingdom of God and the physical kingdom of Christ are going to become one kingdom. Prophesied right here in Psalm 132, the throne of David was always meant to be a joint throne of man and God. Of the fruit of thy body will I sit upon thy throne. Meaning David the son of man is going to be indwelt by the spirit of God. Both one upon one throne. Right here. The throne of God and of the lamb. Amen. That subject runs clear from Genesis to Revelation. This issue of the kingdom. Prepared from the foundation of the world. Amen. God made these promises to David all the way back in 2 Samuel chapter 7. There's a good one for you. I ain't going to keep you guys much longer. There's one right there. I got to start looking at what time I start so I'll know. You want me to remind you? <laughs> no, you'll, you'll lie to me say I started at 1030. <laughs> Right here. The times of restitution which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The mystery which was kept secret since the world began. That's the most important division in the Bible. It's not Old New Testament. The most important division in that Bible is mystery and prophecy. Your New Testament has those two divisions. Romans through Philemon contains the preaching of Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Hebrews through Revelation contains the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures of the prophets. Yeah, amen. And if you don't get that, why, why do you think the vast majority of churches live in Hebrews and Jude and Peter and Revelation and Acts and Matthew and Mark and Luke and John? Any man that's going to try to convince you that eternal security is false, where does he go? James, yep. Hebrews, Revelation. Mm -hmm. Why? The man is ignorant of this mystery. And Paul said, I would not have you ignorant of this mystery, lest ye be wise in your own conceits. Guess what, guys? That means when you find a preacher, if you know and understand your basic educational doctrine taught in the book of Romans, if you find a preacher and you say, do you know the mystery of Christ? And he can't tell you the mystery of Christ? That man can only be wise in his own conceits. That's why every time you ask him a question... He don't have an answer. And if he does give you an answer, he fumbles around chasing his own tail for about 45 minutes and could just never gives you a satisfactory answer and never gives you one scripture to back up what he's saying. And if he does give you scripture, he's back there under the law of Moses and all over the place. Y'all got, got this one. 
How much, how much y'all want to bet we're supposed to rightly divide what was spoken and what, kept, what was kept secret? Matthew, Luke 24, this is what Christ did for those apostles. He opened their understanding that they might understand what? But here's what he gave Paul. By revelation, he made known unto me the mystery. Which another, these men were given understanding of what had already been made known. Paul received understanding of what was not yet written. And he says, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. There's only one place you can get understanding of the mystery of Christ, and it's in what Paul wrote. Yeah. Because it wasn't contained here. That means these men here had a different ministry than this man right here. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, right. Say, I don't agree, preacher. Why? Because you haven't heard it before today. <laughs> I'm showing you what the scriptures say. Who was Jesus a minister of? Jesus. Then it ain't you. You don't believe it? Ask Christ himself. Yeah. I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Amen. Then it ain't you. He was a minister of the circumcision and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. His mercy to who? Israel. Paul gives you four quotes out of the Old Testament about the Gentiles according to the prophetic scripture. However, through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. That means between Matthew 15, when he's only sent to Israel, to salvation coming unto the Gentiles in Romans 11, something's happened. Because what prophecy said is that the Gentiles would come to Israel's light and kings would come to the brightness of thy what? Not their, they're different. Prophetically, the Gentiles were going to come to the brightness of Israel's rising. Here, the gen salvation's coming to the Gentiles through Israel's fall and blindness. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until what? And so all Israel shall be saved as it is. Now get it. Right here's Gentiles according as it is written. Here's the Gentiles according to the mystery. Here's Israel according to the mystery. Here's Israel according to prophecy. And if you get them messed up, you're going to be messed up. Amen. Baptism. I'll close with this one, guys. Baptism. Because boy, boy, boy. You, you say, you say, is it really that important? Is it important enough for Rome to slaughter about 69 million people all over Europe? Amen. Why do you think so many people were willing to cross the Atlantic at that time? Bloody Mary gathered a bunch of them in France one time under a so-called peace talk, and she killed so many, so many, I believe it was Huguenots, she killed so many of them that they said the river ran red with blood for two days after. They're still fighting over this doctrine. I'm going to show you what the Bible says about it. I indeed baptize you with. But he that cometh after me. 
He shall baptize you with and with how many is that? One, two, three. So then who taught you to assume that? Not the Bible. The Bible never taught you to assume water when dealing with baptism. Religion taught you that from the time you were this big. And you can't get, until you get your head corrected on it, the Bible ain't going to make no sense to you. I learned real quick as a, as a young man that in order to renew my mind, God had to unlearn and correct all the bad stuff I had in my head so that he could teach me the truth. Because as long as I got that bad imagination in my head, I'm blinded to the truth of God. How can I go through the Bible reading baptism? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ have been baptized into his. How can I go through my Bible reading that when I've been taught incorrectly to assume water every time I read the word? Now here, here's, here's the kind of book you're dealing with. Them Jews are told in Hebrews 6 to leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And one of those principles of that doctrine is the doctrine of baptisms, plural. Right? Now if there's an S on it, that means there's more than one. Yes. And then Paul, the little the little sneaky devil tells us there's one baptism. <laughs> I love that Bible. That Bible's booby trapped from cover to cover. You get your heart right or it'll take you in your own craftiness. I mean that from the bottom of my heart, man. Yeah, how many of y'all agree with what I just said? It's rigged from cover to cover. You get your heart right or it's going to take you in your own craftiness. Amen? Because there's more than one there. There's only one there. Well, what's this one baptism Paul's talking about? Well, look at that right there. One what? For by one spirit are we all what? So this is the one baptism Paul's referring to. It's a baptism by one spirit into one body. Well, how do you get that, that one baptism? You get it through one faith. How did you get the spirit? By the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? There's only one way into Christ. It's by one baptism. And you can get sprinkled, you can get dunked, you can get immersed in as many names as you want to get in. Until you receive this spirit through the hearing of faith, you're not in Christ. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. What about John? Was John sent to baptize? Here's the 12. Go ye therefore and teach all nations doing what? Here's Paul. Christ sent me not to baptize. I give up. I'm going to the house. How can, you know how many, you know how many Baptist preachers think John the Baptist was the beginning of the Baptist church? The first Baptist church at Jerusalem, you know. Why was John sent to baptize? He tells you he was sent to baptize to manifest Jesus Christ to Israel. Had nothing to do with you Gentiles. These 12 apostles here, long before Paul's mysteries ever made known, they're sent forth to teach all nations and baptize them. And then God called Saul of Tarsus out in Acts chapter 8. And sent him out in Acts chapter 13. And Paul tells you that he was not sent to baptize but to preach the gospel. Now did Paul baptize? Yes he did. But you got to under, Paul also circumcised. Paul also raised dead men. Amen. Did Paul circumcise Timothy? Did he ever command, command any of you to circumcise? Did he baptize? Did he ever command any of you to do it? He become all things to all men, Gary. 
Paul used his liberty in Christ to serve others in love. When he went to a Jew, he went as a Jew. When he went to the Gentile, he went as a Gentile. He went, when he went to them that were without law, he went as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. He baptized some. You know, in fact, when Paul talks about his ministry to the Gentiles, knowing that God sent salvation to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy, you know what Paul said? If that's the case, then I'm going to magnify mine office that I may provoke to emulation them that are my flesh that I may save some. So Paul takes a, Jew, a Gentile over there and he baptizes them in water and lets a Jew see it. Why? He's trying to provoke them. But I ain't worried about what he did. What I'm worried about is what he was sent to do. Because people take these ministries and they just mix them together. And that's where all your confusion's coming from today. It's people that can't rightly divide this stuff. Acts 2.38, right there. Men and brethren, what shall I do? No. What's it say? Who's the, who's the pronoun there? It's Israel. What did Peter just preach? Peter just preached that God had sent the one the prophets foretold of. Israel took him and with wicked hands crucified him. And that God took that same man whom they crucified and made him both Lord and Christ. And now they say, what shall we do? Israel. This is not being preached to any Gentiles in Acts 2. And if this is your plan of salvation today, you're messed up. And we send every missionary out with that. This, this doctrine right here. This is not the plan of salvation today. I'm going to show you that here in a second. He says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Next verse, for the promise is unto you. What promise? The promise of Joel 2, 28. Go back and read the book of Joel. It's about Israel at the time of the day of the Lord and a call to repentance. And if they will repent, God said, afterward, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. This is what Israel has to do in order to receive the promise of the big book of Joel. What happened to them? They fell. They didn't believe. Acts chapter 7, they fall. Completely and totally they fall. God calls Paul, send salvation to the Gentiles. Look, similar question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and ye for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You say, preacher, you really think they're the same? If words mean anything, they're different. Repent and be baptized is not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That one is spoken to a nation. This one is spoken to an individual sinner. Mm -hmm. They're not even the same question. Yep. Amen. Mm -hmm. You with me? And, but we had to be baptized to be a member of this church. Mm-hmm. The thing is, the thing is, is this, this, this is what Peter and them were sent to do. That repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name beginning at Jerusalem. That's where they are, right here. Yep. Then Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. But Jerusalem is called to be the light of the world. If Jerusalem don't repent, so in Acts 7, 
One last chance, the Holy Ghost goes face to face with the rulers of Israel. Takes them through their whole history and then says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hearts and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Drag him outside, beat him up, stoned him to death. God says, all right, Acts chapter 9, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Then he tells Ananias, this is my chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles. And right there he is in, in Philippi. Yep. And a Philippian jailer asks him what he has to do to be saved. And he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Yep. Amen. Now how messed up is religion? The Church of Christ, you know what the Church of Christ does? They just blend it all together. They put it all in a big blender. <laughs> and try to Try to get you this stuff right here. Uh -huh. Try to peach you a little bit of all of it. They might even throw some law back in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your salvation. Amen. Got you going through the 70th week of Daniel and everything. Amen. Amen. All because they're ignorant of the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Any questions? I might finish this. Another, well, I was almost done. All right. Interesting on uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 where it says study to show myself approved. Study is taken out and uh, to divide, rightly divide the word of truth is taken out all the English words. Oh, yep. yep. Now, the, the new King James does have rightly dividing, but they don't have study. Mm -hmm. they, the, the, the way the new Bibles read that verse it's because Satan knows that a man that does that, that's the point I was making. Yeah. The man who does that is a threat to his snare. Yeah. Yeah. Read the chapter. Yeah. So the very thing that threatens the snare and the system Satan has set up, the very threat to it is a man that studies and rightly divides. So all the new Bibles, give all diligence to show yourself approved unto God. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know what that means? Just try your little hardest. Do your best to approve yourself unto God. Accurately handling the word of truth. I mean, if you, you, you can act, I can tell you what these verses say and accurately handle it. But that's not what God's looking for. He's looking for somebody that rightly divides it. Hey Amen. Good point, Dave. Very good point, brother. Anybody else? Before we close. One thing I told you the best advice Pastor Dream ever gave me when I was a new uh, Christian, I bought a living Bible. He came here with it. He said, What do you got there, brother? I said, Living Bible. He said, Here. He took it, dropped it in the garbage can. Over there. <laughs> I had to bring that into the church. There's only one scripture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that taught me real quick. <laughs> well, that's the, uh, that's actually the prerequisite. <laughs> That's that's the whole the whole foundation of this verse. Yeah. If you ain't got the word of truth, you ain't got nothing to study and rightly divide. So the King James issue is the issue right up front. Yeah. Right. And the King James is the only book that you can rightly divide because they've so messed with the words in other translations, other versions, you're never going to get it rightly divided. Mm -hmm. Because what are they trying to do? They're trying to help God out. Now this is what he meant, and so because we only believe in one gospel, we're going to try to reconcile all the Bible and try to help God make sense of his own word. Hey man, I've watched it, guys. Yeah. All right. Uh, Conrad, you close this out in prayer, brother. Amen.